Okay, we've um, just started the recording of our second lecture and uh, we will get started. Any thoughts, any questions at this point before we go forward? Okay, let's go. We'll just continue with uh, the PDF. All right. So we said that we've been predestined, God predestined. That means God pre-planned for us certain things. And uh, he predestined us to his purpose. The next thing is that we see in this whole sequence of what God is doing for us. We said he foreknew, that means he chose us. He predestined us. That was he pre-planned something and he pre predestined that we be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And those he predestined, he also called. So we're just looking at it. We are the called and we are called according to his purpose. All right, we're called according to his purpose. So we are chosen, we are predestined, we are called, we are chosen to be loved by him. We are predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And we are called to his purpose. And that's why the Bible, you know, when the Bible says, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. So, no, so this 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 giving us this wonderful assurance that you know when things are working out in our lives somehow God, because He's God and at work in our lives, He's going to cause everything to work together for good. To work together for good, because we love God, and we are. You know, we are called according to His purpose, and we are moving, and living, according to the purpose of God. So as a son and daughter of God, what must you know? We said first, you're a child of God, you're born in his family. Second, you're adopted into his family. This gives us a sense of belonging. Uh, thirdly, uh, you and I are chosen to be loved by God. Fourth, we said we are predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Fifth, we are saying we are called to his purpose. Right? And uh, Paul tells us, you know, that our calling, he says, you see your calling, brethren. He's talking about the general call of God. That you know, not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, the, the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, the base things of the world, and things which are despised, uh, God has chosen. Things which are not to bring to nothing, things that are, that no flesh and glory in his presence. So what the Apostle Paul is telling us here is, you know, when, it, 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 when God calls us, and God says, I'm making you now somebody whom I've called for my purpose, his calling and his purpose is not based on anything that we have in our own selves. You know, we may be highly educated. We may be, you know, very wise or very experienced or this or that. But Paul is saying, you see, God, God can choose the foolish things, the weak things, the base things, things which are despised, the world rejects, and things which don't even exist. God can take any of that. And uh, you know, and, and 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 carry out his purposes through that. So, our, we are called for his purpose, and our calling is not based on anything we carry in ourselves, but it's purely the outworking of the. Uh, the it's purely a work of God, and He will be glorified through all of this, right? and we can. We can say, you know, sometimes we look at ourselves and we say, you know, look, I'm not, you know, I don't have too much to offer for the call of God. It's okay. Because it's not dependent on us. It's dependent on what he is going to bring to pass through us. 
So as a child, as, as a son, as a daughter of God, you and I are called to his purposes. And God's purposes are at work in each one of our lives as his sons and his daughters. And he's going to carry out those purposes, not based on our abilities or skill and talent, but it's simply it's his working through our lives. So as a child of God, as a son or, son or a daughter of God, you are called according to his purpose. Now the call of God is both an invitation and an appointment. I mean, he invited us and we said yes, he appointed us for his purpose. So it gives us a sense of purpose. And then not only are we called, but we are also justified in his sight. Now that's back in Romans 8, in the same verse, we said, whom he called, these he also justified. Right? So that means he said, I'm making you right in my eyes. And we've, we've studied this whole truth of justification, that God has justified us. So that's the next point. We are justified in his sight. Uh, when, when God has justified us, there is a complete sense of freedom in his presence. That means nobody can uh, bring a charge against us or an accusation against us because we have been justified in his sight. So as a son and a daughter of God, you have been adopted in his family. You've been chosen to be loved. You've been predestined to uh, be conformed to the image of Jesus. You're being called according to his purpose. And you're also justified in his sight. Means God says, there's, not, there's no condemnation against you. So therefore, you know, in Romans 8, Paul is saying, who will bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore has also risen who is at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. So nobody can bring an accusation or a condemnation against us because God himself has justified us. Right? And then we are also glorified together with Jesus. So we see this. Uh, those whom he justified, he also glorified. Right? So just to recap, he for knew us, that means he chose us in him. He predestined us, that means he had a plan ahead of, of time for us. He called us for his own purposes. He justified us, he's given us complete, uh, a perfect standing in his sight. And he also glorified us. How did he glorify us? He made us heirs and joint heirs and brothers with the son. So how did God glorify us? He put us in this place of uh, this elevated place uh, of honor, making us his sons and daughters. And not only his sons and daughters, but he says, look, I've glorified you. I've elevated you. I've put you in a place of honor. That means you're now an heir of God and you're a joint heir with Jesus. You're a co-heir. You're a brother with the son. You know, you're, he's the firstborn among many brethren, it says, right? So he has glorified us by making us heirs, joint heirs, and brothers with the Son. And this gives us a great sense of worth. You know, you are in the spirit realm, you are, you have been glorified. Okay, so what we have done is this. We've just said that God has made us his children and as children, he's done all this for us as his sons and daughters. He chose us, predestined us, called us, he justified us, he glorified us. Glorified means he put us in this place, elevated us to this place of honor where we would be heirs and joint heirs with the Son. So how do we live? So I'm going to transition now. And how do we live as sons and daughters? You know, uh, what, what does it mean in, in, for us in everyday life? 
and I just want to highlight these, you know, uh, uh, these six, sorry, these five points here uh, uh, in living out as sons and daughters, right? So first, we must understand that we are beloved of the Father, right? Because it tells us, Ephesians 1, 4, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. You are before him in love. So you are beloved of the Father. You are a son and a daughter of God. That means the Father loves you unconditionally, unchangeably, immeasurably. He loves you. Right? So you are a beloved of the Father. So that's a truth that we must, you know, let settle in our hearts. As a son and a daughter of God, God loves me. And what kind of love is this? You know, um, we ha there's a, um, a free book that we have called The Father's Love, and it'll be a useful thing to read uh, to, to help us understand the immensity of God's love for us. But we're going to look at a few of these scriptures here. Could somebody read Romans 8, 35 to 39 for us, please? Romans 8, 35 to 39, please. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Notice, the focus is the love of God, the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Right? So he's saying, you know, who can separate us from the love of Christ, the love of Christ, the love of God? What can separate us? You know, can it be these difficult situations? Can it be death or life, angels, principalities, what can separate us? So because God loves us so immensely, he says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. So as a son and a daughter of God, you must understand, we must understand We must that nothing can separate us or take us away from the love of God, which is in Christ. So in Christ, you are so immensely loved by God. That no matter what you're going through, no matter what your situations, no matter what our challenges are, no matter what situations are, God is not going to abandon his love. Now, this is unlike human love, right? Human love is, is fragile, meaning people can only love to a certain extent. And then when the situation is very hard, the situation is very difficult, they give up. They say, look, I can't love you anymore. I, I can't handle it. But not like that with God. That no matter, so Paul tries to list certain, you know, all these conditions, difficulties, persecutions, all that. And he says, nothing can separate us. Nothing will cause God to stop loving us in Christ. And because we are assured of that immense love and unfailing love, he says, in all these things, and that means in every situation, every circumstance, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. That means his love is so unfailing Nothing, it's unbreakable. It's unbreakable. And that love is going to put us over. That love is going to bring us through. 
And that's why we are more than conquerors. A conqueror is going to win every time. A conqueror is going to overcome what he faces. A conqueror is going to be triumphant. And Paul says we are more than that. Because we are going to be triumphant and more in every situation. Why? Because of this unbreakable, unfailing, unchangeable, immeasurable love that God has for us in Christ. You are you and I are sons and daughters of God. We are in him, chosen in Christ to be before him in love. So in Christ, there's this immeasurable love that with which God loves you. So you're deeply loved by God. Another facet of this love that I just want to highlight here is this, that we are loved the same way the Father loves Jesus. Could somebody read John 17, 23 for us, please? John 17, 23. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Mm, thank you. So notice what Jesus is praying to the Father and says, Father, that I want you, you know, I'm praying that they will know that I'm in you, you're in me, that they may be made perfect in one that is his own people, his disciples. And I want them to know that you have loved them as you have loved me. Think about this. The Father loves you just the same way he loves Jesus. The Father loves me the same way he loves Jesus. He says, and I've loved them as you have loved me. And that's something you and I need to tell ourselves. It's, you know, let it sink in our hearts and minds. You know, because we tend to think, well, Jesus is perfect. I am not perfect. So obviously the Father will love Jesus much more than he loves me. But Jesus is saying, no, that you've loved them just as you've loved me. So it's, it's together. God's, the depth of God's love for you is the same as his love for his son, Jesus Christ. And it's that eternal love that he had even before the foundation of the world. So the Father loves you just as he loves Jesus. So you, need, you and I need to acknowledge that, Father, I thank you that you love me just as much as you love Jesus. You know, you acknowledge that. Because we need to tell ourselves, we need to come to that understanding, we need to come to terms with such great love. Father, I thank you that you love me just as you much as you love Jesus. And then we get an understanding of the depth of the Father's love for you and me, because you are his son, you are his daughter. right? And Paul prays this prayer you know, he prays for the believers and he, his prayer is that, you know, that believers will come to understand something about the love of Christ. Right? So let's read this passage, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 to 18. Could somebody read that for us, please? Verse 14 to 18. Please go ahead. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 18. Is that right, Pastor? Yeah, verse 14 to 18. Yes. Verse 14 to 18. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 to 18. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in the, he every family in the heaven and on earth is named that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be the strengthened, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith that you, being, I'm taking the 17 again, 
so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to, uh, to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So Paul says, you know, I'm praying for you that God would grant you according to, you know, his riches. And, and, he, and he prays different things. And he says, I want you to be rooted in love, grounded in love. And I want you to be able to comprehend. I want you to get a comprehension, an understanding, uh, uh, something that comes by experience. I want you to comprehend. I want you to experience or and get an experiential knowledge. I want you to comprehend with all the other believers, with all the saints, the width, the length, the depth, the height, and to know the love of Christ, which actually is beyond comprehension, which passes knowledge. So he says, look, I want you to get an understanding of something that is beyond understanding. I want you to comprehend something that is actually beyond comprehension. So obviously that, that comprehension that we are going to have, which we're going to, you know, to know, it's something the Holy Spirit's going to help us. He's going to help us comprehend. He's going to help us know the love of Christ. He says, I want you to understand, get some understanding of how wide, of high, how wide, of broad, how deep, how high the love of Christ is. So that we can be grounded, rooted and grounded in love. So part of what has to happen to us and for us is that as believers, we should be so established in the love of God for us. That this love that God has is so immeasurably great that it actually is beyond all measure. You can't measure the width, the length, the depth, and height. But yet you can experience that. And you can experience it in an ever-increasing measure. Because there is no limit to the measure of the width and length and depth and height of that love. Because it's, it's beyond that. It's beyond all of that. And so in an ever-increasing measure, we are able to experience the love of Christ. And we are to be rooted and grounded and so settled in that nothing can shake you. So as a child of God, this is the first thing, to how to live as a child of God. You and I must be so established in God's love for me, in, for you. I'm a child of God. God loves me. No matter what I face, God loves me. You see, the problem is many times people determine God's love based on the circumstance. If the circumstance is good, they think God loves me. If the circumstance is bad, they think God is angry with me. But that is not true. That is not how Paul is telling us. He's saying, look, even if the circumstances are so bad, Nothing can separate you from the love that God has for you. Meaning, God's love for you is so intense. Even when circumstances are all difficult. They're very intense. Nothing can separate you. And you and I need to be so established, rooted and grounded, so established in this love. And we must know it. And learn to receive his love and rest in his love. Say, Father, I thank you that you love me. So acknowledge his love, even in difficult situations. Just acknowledge his love. My God loves me. My God cares for me. My Father, he's my heavenly Father, and he loves me. Right? And I've just taken this from that book on uh, uh, the Father's love that, that's available. You know, he's an unchanging Father, unfailing. He's a bountiful and generous and merciful father. He's a redeeming and accepting father. 
you know, he's an empowering and infinite father. So that's who God is. And that's how our perspective of God must be. The second part as living as sons and daughters of God is that, you know, we are brethren. Right? So Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren. He's the firstborn among many brethren. So that's another interesting thought. We are brethren with the son. He's the firstborn and we are become as his second sons and daughters. <laughs> we come right after him. He's the firstborn. All of us are after him equally. And we are brethren. He's the firstborn among many brethren. So we are family. We are family with each other. And we are family with the Son of God, with Jesus Christ. And I just want to highlight this, you know, one part of it, which is that as our elder brother, he is helping us. You know, you can think about this, uh, you know, when kids are at play, and let's say there are two brothers, then kids are at play, and let's say the younger brother gets into a fight with some other, you know, it's a wait, wait, I'll go and call my elder brother. <laughs> so his elder brother is his security against all the other guys that he may get into a fight with. I'll call my elder brother. Because elder brother comes, he'll settle the case, he'll settle the matter. And everybody's afraid of the elder brother. And in some sense, Jesus, the Bible tells us, Jesus comes to our aid, to the aid of his brethren. Yeah. And so this passage in Hebrews chapter 2 brings that out for us. Can somebody read that for us, please? Hebrews 2, verse 11, and verses 14 to 18. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11 and 14 to 18. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. And as much then as the children have partaken of, of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does, he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Amen. Amen. So notice some things here. He's not ashamed to call them brethren. So Jesus is not ashamed to call you brethren, his brother or sister. He's not ashamed to call us brethren, to know that we are part of the same family, that he's the firstborn, and we came after him. He's the firstborn among many brethren. He's not ashamed to call us brethren. And he represented us and destroyed the devil for us. So that's the implication. So the elder brother, our elder brother, took care of our biggest enemy, the devil. And release us from the fear of death. He said, don't be afraid of death. It's just a crossing over. Release us from the fear of death. And not only does he release us from the fear of death, he says, he gives aid. He gives assistance. Now, to the seed of Abraham. Now, we are the seed of Abraham spiritually. We're the descendants of Abraham. So he gives aid. He assists. In what way? He says that, you know, he became like us. He made, uh, he, he became like us. He paid for our sins. And so as a merciful and faithful high priest, he is able to aid 
those who are being tempted. So as our elder brother is assisting us in our temptation. So this temptation is not only an inducement to sin, but the word temptation means trials and tribulations also. So it's not just uh, temptation as in, as we understand it in, as an inducement to sin. Temptations includes trials and troubles, or t trials and uh, tribulations. It includes all of that. So he aids us. He aids us. Jesus was tempted. He was tested. He was tried. He went through everything. And so he's able to aid us when we are going through those things. So as a son and daughter of God, the next thing we must understand is we are family, not only with each other, but we are family with the son. And he is the firstborn of many brethren. He is not ashamed to call us brethren. Representing us, he dealt with our biggest enemy, the devil. And today, our elder brother, Jesus, will aid us when we are tempted, tested, tried, and going through hardship. He gives us the strength we need. He gives us what we need to go through those things. So remember that as a son and a daughter of God, the Lord Jesus is there to aid you, to assist you through whatever the temptation, the trial, the difficulty is. Now we talk about the fact that we are heirs, right? So we said that, you know, whom he called them, he justified, whom he justified, he glorified. In what sense did he glorify us? In what sense did he elevate us to a place of honor? Well, the Bible says, Romans 8, 16 and 17, which we just read earlier. If we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and joint us with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. So he says, look, we are heirs of God, we are joint us with Christ. And this is that aspect of being glorified together. So he has glorified us. That means he has elevated us to a place of being heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. So, in this world, even if I face hardship, even if I suffer with him, that's okay. It really doesn't matter. It doesn't compare with the fact that I've been glorified together and I've been made an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. So in this world, uh, we will suffer. Like Romans chapter 8, the context is about facing the sufferings of overcoming sin. Uh, it also deals with the consequences you know, of, of, of uh, the fall that is in the world. So there are all these sufferings, hardships that are caused because of sin and because of the fall that we have to face on this earth. But that is nothing compared to the fact that God has glorified us together as heirs of God and joined us with Christ. What does it mean to be an heir of God? As an heir of God, it simply means God has given us an inheritance. God has given us an inheritance, spiritual inheritance. So understand this, that as a son and a daughter of God, if children, that means of sons and daughters, we're also heirs. That means God has given to us an inheritance. There is something already given to you by God because you are an heir of God. And that's what we need to understand as part of uh, 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 what is our spiritual inheritance? What has God given to me as an heir? And, you know, an inheritance is of no use if you don't know what it is and if you don't take it. So two things we have to do about our inheritance, which we will, you know, one of the things we were trying to achieve through this whole study is to know that God has given you an inheritance, spiritual inheritance. And to know how to walk in it, to know how to enjoy it. Hey, this is what God has given to me. 
and I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to walk in it. At the next chapter, we're going to enumerate some of the things that uh, you know, God has given to us as inheritance in the next chapter. Okay, We're going to list it out, some of the things we've already covered, and some of the things that we uh, need to talk about. But as an heir of God, you have an inheritance in your name, spiritual inheritance, which affects your earthly life. That means you can enjoy it right here on earth. But we are also joint heirs with Christ, right? So we're heirs of God and we are joint heirs with Christ. What does that mean? To be a joint heir means to be a co-heir. That means you share with whatever has been given to Christ. Now that's really staggering that God would say, whatever I've given to Jesus, whatever I've given to Jesus is also given to you. So you look at Jesus, the Son of God. Whatever was given to him as the Son of God is available to all the sons and daughters of God. Now, we must distinguish with, from the fact that Jesus, after his ascension, he was glorified. That means he re retook, or he took that, he stepped into that eternal glory as deity. So we're not talking about becoming deity, so don't misunderstand that. But what we are saying is, as joint heirs with Christ, whatever God the Father gave to the Son of God on this earth, when he walked on this earth, we have access to it. We are joint heirs with Christ. Whatever he walked in, we can walk in. So, We walk as Christ walked. We walked in everything he, God the Father gave him as a son of God. We walk in it. This is, I make you a joint heir with Christ. You share in all that Christ had. Christ was given. He's the firstborn among many, brethren. We came right after. He says, well, everything I've given the firstborn, I'm giving you. You walk in it. So again, this is a staggering thought. This is the life God has called for us. Now, if we don't know it, we can't walk in it. And, you know, some, obviously people ask the question, but why is the church not walking in it? Because the church doesn't know it. The church is settling for something so less. But we have to say, look, we are joint as with Jesus. I'm an heir of God. I'm a joint heir with Jesus. God, I want to walk in my inheritance. I want to walk in the blessing that you've given to me together with Christ. I want it. I can. I want to, you know, be glorified together. That means I want to enjoy this place of honor that you've given me right here, right now. And sure, there is something out in the future which we will enjoy, but there's something that we can enjoy right here and right now. So Jesus walked in victory over sin. He walked in mastery over Satan and his demons. And our life on earth is to be the same as his life on earth. A few more thoughts here as sons and daughters and we'll close this chapter is as sons and daughters we are also ambassadors that means we represent uh, the kingdom you know just as uh, a son or a daughter of a king as an heir when they go to some place says oh you're 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 from that 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 kingdom you know you're representing that king so yeah so people talk more about this in uh, in a, in a later chapter, but we represent the kingdom. So that's what the scriptures say, that we are ambassadors for Christ. Whose ambassadors are we? We are Christ's ambassadors. We are representing him as his sons and daughters. Right? And um, I think this is the last point is as sons and daughters, there's a future glory that all of creation is waiting for. So right now, uh, creation is subject to futility. So let's just read this passage that I'm, then we can explain it. Romans chapter eight, verses 18 to 21, please. 
Somebody could read that for us. For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of, son of, of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Mm. Amen. So, Paul is talking about creation. And he's talking about the children of God, the sons of God. So that's you and me. Now, what he's saying is, there are the sufferings of this present time. So we are on this earth, and there's a lot of hardships. But why is there this suffering? Because creation, that means everything God created here on this earth, was subject to futility, was given over to something that was futile, vain and empty. Not willingly, I means this was not the will of God, but he, he gave it up in hope. That means he knew what was going, he was going to do. What was, what was this futility? Creation was delivered, was, you know, was given over to the bondage of corruption. That means corruption is decay, degradation, deviation from the original design. So all of creation was subject to, then was, came under subjection, bondage to corruption. So in the fall, when Adam and Eve sinned, God created, you know, before that, God, everything was in a perfect state the way God created. But because of the fall, everything was brought into bondage of corruption. That means it started decaying, deviating from God's original design. So God didn't create this world with, you know, uh, volcanoes that destroy and tsunamis that destroy and earthquakes that destroy and uh, with the, uh, he didn't create a world that was so terrible he didn't do that he created a perfect world but from the fall everything went out of out of God's original design it deviated it's a bondage of corruption and so creation itself is in bondage of corruption and that's why we had that sufferings of this present time. But what's happening? There's going to be the glory which shall be revealed, meaning there's something amazing that God's kept ahead in the future. And creation itself is waiting for that, the revealing of the sons of God, because the sons of God are going to step into this wonderful glory. And when that happens, even creation will be delivered from this bondage of corruption and will be brought into that same glorious liberty of the children of God. And, and we will see, we see this in the book of Revelation, chapters 21 and 22 and Second Peter chapter 3, where Paul, you know, Peter writes and then John shares that uh, there will be new heavens and the new earth, that, that this earth will be dissolved, the heavens will melt, and all of this will come to an end there be new heavens and the new earth. And the children of God, the sons of God, will come into this place, just tremendous glory. And there will be none of the sufferings of this present time will be there. So Paul is writing about that glory, the revealing of the sons of God, the glorious liberty, glory which shall be revealed. And this is going to be this glorious liberty of the children of God. That means... God has got something more kept for us as his sons and daughters. And that what which he has kept for us will be given in a new heaven and a new earth. When this present world, which currently is in the bondage of corruption, will be delivered from that. There will be no more corruption in that world. See, in this world, there is sickness, there is disease, there is all kinds of things happening. Why? Because this, this world is in the bondage of corruption. But in that world, this, this, you know, this, all of creation will be delivered from it. And uh, 
God is going to give that over to the children of God, the sons of God. And so this is something God has prepared for us as sons and daughters of God. Right? We will close with this verse. Somebody could read First John chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. I know we are rushing. I'll just read this and close. And if there are questions, we will definitely pick it up next week, please. Could somebody read this, First John 3, 1 to 3? First John chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Amen. Amen. So it's talking about us as children of God. And that's what this chapter was about. It says, you know, we are children of God. And we talked about the love the Father has bestowed on us. But he says, you know, um, we still don't, don't know and don't experience everything yet. There's so much more coming. He says, you know, when he's revealed, we will be like him. Imagine, we shall be like him. We shall be like Jesus. That's God's ultimate plan. That for all of us to be conformed to Jesus, we shall be like him. And sorry, this is a great blessing is God for his children. We are children of God. And when he is revealed. We will be like him. And he says, because we have this hope, we keep ourselves pure because we have this hope. So what did we see in this chapter? We are children of God, born into his family in Christ. We are adopted into his family in Christ. And as people have been adopted, we are chosen to be loved by God. We are predestined to become like Jesus. We are called to his purpose. We are justified in his sight. We are glorified with Jesus. We are glorified as his sons and daughters. How do we live as sons and daughters? We said we must be established in the Father's love. Just know the Father loves you. Be established in that love. Secondly, we live as brethren. Jesus is our elder brother. He comes to our aid. He's going to stand by us. He's going to help us. Third, we know we are heirs of God. We have an inheritance. We will walk in it. Be a joint heirs. Therefore, we walk as Christ walked. Whatever, every blessing is given to Christ is ours. And then, Number five, we look forward for this glorious hope, this glorious blessing that says so much more that God has reserved for us. And we look forward to that. Amen. So uh, I, I, I'm just going to pause here. I know I've actually gone over time. Um, I, I just want to encourage you to, you know, just think about these things. And then uh, next week, you know, we will keep some time for question answers. If if you have any questions and you want me to explain anything, we will to take time to do that. Okay. Now can we close in prayer? Somebody can pray and dismiss us, please, and we can get ready for our next class. I know we are over time already. Can somebody pray? Right. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for teaching us, Father, Lord, from your word. Uh, Father, so many things that we might just uh, read through, Lord, and uh, do not comprehend, Father, but you helped us understand, Father, Lord, these truths, Father. May the Holy Spirit, Father, Lord, enable us, Father, to uh, live out of these truths, Father, Lord, to walk in these truths, Lord, that, uh, um, uh, Lord, our lives uh, be an example to others, Father, that we may teach others, equip others as well, Father, 
to um, to the very purposes, Father Lord, that you have, uh, uh, Lord, chosen us, Lord, predestined us, Lord. You have called us, Father Lord. You have, uh, Lord, chosen us so that you uh, love us, Father Lord. Uh, thank you, Father, that you have given us, Father, this great privilege to be heirs and Go ahead, uh, go as with Jesus Christ, Lord. I mm -hmm. uh, thank you and praise you, Father. Help us, Father, that these truths may sink in, Father, Lord, to our uh, spirits, Father, to our minds, Father, that our lives be transformed, Father. Bless Pastor Rashish, Father, Lord, uh, and every uh, student here, Father, Lord. Thank you and praise you in Jesus' precious name. We pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a quick break and uh, get ready for your next class. Sorry, it took a little extra time. God bless you all. See you again. Bye.